Welcome to another episode of Breakaway from the Rat Race. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Terry Painter. He's the author of the, the uh, fabulous book called The Encyclopedia of Commercial Real Estate Advice. Uh, he is also the founder of Apartment Loan Store and Business Loan Store. He has uh, two mortgage banking firms uh, where he has closed hundreds of commercial real estate loans over the past 24 years. Uh, so Terry uh, has a lot of experience and uh, he's going to share with us uh, his expertise on commercial and multifamily properties. Welcome to the show, Terry. Hey, thanks for having me, Eric. It's good to be yeah. here. So that's a pretty interesting book. Uh, this It really covers kind of for my audience. I think this what's really important is that we already have some uh, some clients on Martel Turnkey that have They've built a little bit of a portfolio and then they want to kind of like know what's the next step here do i keep adding yes you can keep adding but can i go into multifamily? can i go into commercial they want to explore a little bit more uh, so tell me more about so your book is very interesting for that perspective but tell me a little bit more about why you wrote the book and is this the right book for somebody that's a, a new new to multifamily or new to commercial okay well, actually, I wasn't planning on writing this book, but Wiley Publishers, they published the Dummies books. An editor called me, contacted me, and asked me that they, they were looking for somebody to write this, this exact book. And with a more of a bent towards, uh, most of their books are very educational, uh, towards newbies, exactly what we're talking about right now. And mm -hmm. anyway, so I thought about, you know, encyclopedia, they already, it was going to be called the, Ency the Commercial Real Estate Encyclopedia. But my thought was, okay, I think I'm the right person to write that book because of my experience working on every type of commercial real estate just about, and just you know working on hundreds of deals. But I thought, how am I, I'm gonna, I can't write a book that's boring. If you think about encyclopedia, uh, yeah. you know, that's like uh, not an exciting topic. So yeah. what I did is I, so what they, they wanted it to be just an encyclopedia. What I did is I combined it. I decided to write a how-to book with an encyclopedia and they loved the idea. And I also, what I did it to make it not to make it a good read is I just throughout the book, it's really chuck full of examples from my clients' stories. Some of them have really made it. Some of them fell into pitfalls, pitfall, pitfalls that they had a hard time getting out of. And so, and also I've had quite a bit of experience like just teaching seminars to people on how to get into commercial real estate and how to finance commercial real estate. So, mm -hmm. so that's how that's how it started. With me writing this book so yeah well this is very yeah this is very interesting yeah because obviously when you see encyclopedia i um, mean you're thinking oh my god this is going to be like a, a series of definitions or something like that but yeah your book is yeah. is much more practical and it's filled with examples from uh your clients and your own experience uh, in commercial real estate so, um, exactly. so, so yeah, so let's talk about kind of like that bridge. So I have a little bit of experience, maybe I have no experience into, uh, into real estate at all. And now I want to jump into multifamily or commercial real estate. So what, what does that look like? What, which direction should I go? Uh, should I go with uh, what size of multifamily or apartment building should I go for? Should I go for in or, or even well, commercial? What should I do? Yeah, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to start off by telling you a story that's just it still blows me away today. This happened in 2004. Uh, I got this call from a lady named Kelly Fabros who wanted to retire at the age of 32 from the LAPD uh, police force and she, uh, through uh, investing in real estate. And she calls me and she says, hey, Terry, I've just found this property in uh, Wichita, Kansas, that you know, I want to buy. And I said, well, how many units is it? She said, uh, she said uh, 94. And I said, well, what's the purchase price? She said, uh, 68 million. So I said, okay, well, well, tell me like how much money do you have to invest? And she, she had like about 160,000 to invest. And she also, I, so I said, well, you know, like what's your experience? If you own a property this size? She said, well, I have a rental, you know, that we rent and that's it. So I said, I'm, well, I'm really sorry, but you know, you're really not qualified to buy this property. What you should do is you know, find something that you could just step into, like maybe a fourplex, go from a single family home rental to a fourplex, but don't try to do 94 units at this time. You know, you're just not gonna make it. She said, she said, well, you don't have to insult me. 
uh, please. She said, this is the property I want to get. This is the right one. And I said, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just being practical. You only have like 2% to put down and you're going to need like 25%. She said, but well, Kelly had taken this course called the Maui Millionaires, where they actually train you how to raise capital from investors when you find a dynamite property. Well, the thing about Kelly is the reason she actually pulled this off. The reason she really, the number one reason she pulled it off is she did not know she could not do it. So often, and this is true for any entrepreneur, keep in mind that commercial real estate is a business. People get into it because they get excited about it. Yeah. And it, it, they're driven by that excitement and they don't know they can't do it. So yeah. for that reason, they have their attitude doesn't, they don't have these thoughts of, oh, what if, you know, everybody could tell I'm just winging it. What if I fail? You know, they're not, they're, that's not where they're coming from. So mm -hmm. Kelly actually, she did raise an investor. And she, well, first of all, um, she brought in an investor from, you know, an executive Intel, her parents and a few other people. And she had the down payment, so she had my attention. And then I gave her this really large due diligence list and she knocked off 100% of it. Well, she did go on to being a multimillionaire because she invested in many more properties after this one and mm -hmm. she became quite good at it. And yeah. what, you know, what really gets down to it, even if you don't have experience, um, you could get uh, like a lender's experience like myself just by finding a really good quality property. And that's mm -hmm. hard to do today. So, yeah, but but for sure, if, if if you guys out there, if you already own some single family rentals or even just one or you want to get into it, it's really the same thing. It's just that multifamily is commercial real estate. When it becomes five units or more, then you're in the commercial real estate arena. And now it gets more complicated just to get it's, you know, just to get a, a single family rental loan can be done, you know, by anybody who has probably. Um, you know, let's just say a 680, 720 real, you know, FICA score uh, and some good motivation, you know, and a good yeah. property. Yeah. But to yeah. get into commercial real estate, you know, now, now it's now it's actually now the income of the property is king. So mm -hmm. you've got to start thinking in terms of finding properties that will cash flow yeah. the loan you want today, plus leave you some profit, you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing about getting into multifamily, let's just say if you moved from um, let's see a portfolio of four properties. Now you're going all over town trying to do the maintenance, managing these properties and so on. Let's say if you moved up even to an eight or 12 unit property. Well, now and under one roof, now you have what we call economy of scale. Mm -hmm. Now you're, what's gonna happen is your maintenance costs are gonna come down. Uh, your management costs should come down a bit. And, um, and also just your time because you're now running a property that's all under one roof. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and also, your uh, appreciation on that property is going to also improve too. Does that make yeah, sense? I mean, yeah, yeah. And what I what I really like about the the commercial uh, side of things, the commercial real estate or multifamily, is that it's really driven by the net operating income and the cap rate. I mean, this is how you would get the value of the property, and you can really by just kind of by imp improving on the net operating income you're automatically increasing the value of the property. So it could be uh, you're increasing rent, mm -hmm. you're cutting down some of the uh, extraneous expenses by renovating uh, some old things or something like that. And just improving the property really adds, uh, adds value to the property, which is something that you don't see too much in this, on the single family rental, because on the single family rentals, the properties are evaluated by with comparable sales. Um, so it doesn't matter that this house is making $5,000 a month in net cash flow because the house beside it is only worth $100,000. This is what you're going to get. Uh, this is going to be the appraised value. So this is kind of like, the, the, for me, this is a, a defining uh, characteristic of, uh, of the commercial side, multifamily especially, compared to single family rental, is that you can really increase the value of that property. Right. Yeah, and, and also when you increase the value of the property, value goes up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, if you, when you, if you, as long as you're able to increase rents over time, the property value will go up because yeah. you know, like you mentioned, um, the sales comparison approach is king in a residential appraisal and, you know, uh, multifamily or commercial appraisal 
uh, the income approach is king. So they're really looking at it as a business. And so just taking a look at the property income. And so just getting started out of the gate, though, the thing that you've got to think about, you've got to stop just looking at properties that um, just that this is something I would like to live in. For sure, starting out, you should buy in a good, safe neighborhood. There's no mm -hmm. question about that. You really want to lower your risks. In my book, in chapter one, I go through mm -hmm. all the all this uh, quite a bit of material on how to lower your risk when you're getting started. But the most important thing is to not think about um, how good this property is going to look to your friends, because it's not like you're going to be living there. But mm -hmm. you have to take a look at start looking at it from day one as a business. Yeah. And you want it, and because properties are you know so expensive today, it's not necessarily easy to find a property that is in a great neighborhood that's at a price that's going to cash flow the loan you want, mm -hmm. and you know, and so for that reason, you if you could find some that have some upsides where you could do some value adds, that's yeah. really what's going yeah. to get you to a place where you're going to make money in four or five years mm -hmm. um, on appreciation and also rental increases. Yeah, yeah. So what does it take to get started? So now, now you, you really have me intrigued and hooked on, you know, increasing value of a property, increasing the rent, and then I can, you know, so I, I think this is, uh, I'm sold on the idea. Mm -hmm. I'm in really interested in multifamily rental. So what does that, how do I know that I'm ready for that? What does it take to get to, to that level? Okay. Well, the most important thing is to realize that this is a business. And if you, as you, everybody knows that ex people who have an experience in a line of work, like if you're an auto mechanic and, and you decide you want to open up a shop, fixing other people's car, you know, just, and you've always worked for somebody else. Let's just say, that's great. You have the experience. You can, you know, just translate that into owning your own business probably. But, but the thing that there's a lot of real estate gurus that will tell you getting into commercial real estate is easy. And if that was true, I guess anybody can do it. But the truth of it is, is that it's not easy. It costs a lot of money. But if you study the process, and, and my book will tell you how to do that, um, it will, then you actually can go into purchasing your first property intelligently. But what you have to start, what you need to start thinking about is uh, whether this business is right for you. It's not necessarily the easiest business to get into, yeah. uh, you know, investing in multifamily properties, let's say, if you're just doing it for the money. I mean, you really have to have an, you have to have an interest in real estate. Those are the people that are the most successful. And you also need to know what your, what your goals are. Like, are you, um, and what you really truly want. You need to center on, uh, in my book, I actually go through uh, like seven different criteria of what you need to identify to find a property. Like, let's just start out with what can you afford? You know, mm -hmm. what does the financing support? Um, you know, keep in mind that you're going to uh, probably have to put uh, at least 25% down on any commercial property today, probably more. And so that means you might have to raise an investor or partner with somebody if you don't have the cash right now. Yeah. Now, if you find the good news is that if you find the property, it's going to be your deal, you know? So um, you also have to think about like what sort of, cash on cash return do you want? What sort of, you you know, what can you live with now? Because if you're going to buy a property right now, you're not going to get a very good return on your investment probably for the first two years. But what you can do is raise rents and, you know, by doing a few value adds, hopefully just cosmetic ones. And, but you need to know like what value adds are you looking for when you're looking for a multifamily property today? Mm -hmm. So. I think one of those, uh, also, let's talk about time, the amount of time that you need. So obviously, you need some, some, uh, you know, you need a little bit more money than a single family rental, uh, you know, 20% of $100,000 is very different than, you know, 25% of like your, uh, your lady in Oklahoma, uh, or not Oklahoma, or Topeka, Kansas, or something like that. It was like, yeah, uh, 25 percent of 68 million dollars it's a little bit different the scale is very different in terms of, of that so you have to be a little bit more resourceful on you know finding the funds or having the funds available but i think also question of time how much time does it need to to get that off the ground yeah well if you just think about okay so one of the things i want to make really clear here if you're excited and you're listening to the show 
you probably have the enthusiasm and the excitement to do this. So, you know, I'm, I don't want to, what I don't want to do is discourage people from getting into this if they have some excitement, because that means you're going to stay up late at night, go on to LoopNet, which is the, the best international, I'm sorry, the best uh, national site for finding properties uh, in all 50 states. And you're going to start searching for properties and educating yourself on, you know, how many units do you get, let's say, um, you know, in Chicago, in a good neighbor in Chicago right now, how many units do you get in your own backyard for the same price, right. you know? And so you have to, so excitement and wanting to do this is really a good part of it. And so just think, so, um, but actually, as far as time goes, you have to realize that if you're, let's just say, if you have to have time and energy. If you're working, you know, like I love what I do. So at the end of the day, it's hard for me to stop. You know, I do get tired at times, but I want to keep working. So if you have that, yeah. if you're that type of person and you can actually, you know, have energy after you've worked all day to actually then look for properties and evaluate them, then this is great. But yeah. you have to have, but keep in mind that it's going to take quite a bit of time. Um, starting with, just as I mentioned, just finding the right property, which is, which is, which is a daunting task today because it's yeah. still at such a seller's market. Secondly, evaluating the financials of the property. Um, and then, and also the other thing too, is that because it's a seller's market, you know, buyers are being really screened right now very tightly. So, um, so I have some, you know, I can go, I could go into that, but as far as getting started, mm -hmm. um, to, in today's market, it really makes sense to get a mentor who could join with you, who has the experience. Now, what you're going to do is find the right property. You're going to find a property that. Um, has these three characteristics. Number one, it's in a good location. Number two, it can be just by, let's just say doing some cosmetic upgrades, yeah. you know, even though it might not be making a ton of money to very much money today, but, but let's just say you just have to change the floor coverings of the units, uh, the window coverings, maybe paint the cabinets uh, and paint the exterior of the building that you could actually raise the rent. So, what you want to do is find the right properties in a safe neighborhood, then get um, somebody to mentor you who can actually qualify for the financing because they have the experience uh, and also impress the, the real estate brokers that they have what it takes to get a loan and also run this property. You also want to uh, have your property management company lined up. Uh, it's really going to be tough where you can get certainly get by with managing one to four the four units yourself, you know, lenders are going to want you to probably have professional property management if you don't have the ex you know, experience running, you know, the number of units that you're that you want to purchase. So, uh, <clears throat> but, but anyway, but then you want to actually be able to uh, just like you want to, you need to actually rehearse your pitch to lenders and investors if you're going to raise investors. And this is called faking until you make it. You've got to be pretty good at doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for us, I mean, something that was, uh, when you talk about value add and all of that, I mean, that's when we bought our apartment buildings. We have a few in uh, in Memphis. And then, yeah, we it was pretty interesting because the buyer was, he was managing the property himself. Uh, it, one of them was like a 20 unit apartment building. And then when we bought the property, he was telling us basically, we were talking about potentially investing in that doing value add changing the floors uh that kind of stuff and he kept telling us that oh this like you know that's worthless you're never going to be able to increase the rent here and just like you know good good sales mm -hmm. job <laughs> but he was uh, it was pretty interesting right. but we were convinced uh, because we had invested in, in memphis for uh, for a few years we were very convinced that the what rent we could get at that particular location we were very familiar with what was going on what new developments were coming up and then we knew that we could we could easily add like uh, double up uh, close to double the rent uh, by doing uh, the the appropriate wow. renovation that's a huge yeah. upside yeah mm -hmm. and that's what we yeah, yeah we basically moved the rent from 500 to 850 dollars a month mm -hmm. on these properties so uh -huh. Yeah, but the local guy, the guy that was yeah, owning the property, never saw the value in the pro the piece of property that he owned. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's that's a good point. Like if you could find a property from somebody who's just all worn out and they just haven't raised the rents in a long time mm -hmm. because they just have been, 
emotionally attached to their tenants too. And maybe they're, they're yeah. you know, once again, you've got to look at this as a business. And if you come in, you know, when, when a new owner comes in, they don't have that emotional attachment and they're willing to raise rents or replace tenants, uh, which isn't very nice, I guess, but it is, but it's something that you have to be willing to do. You know, if you think about yeah. the risk you're taking, yeah. the other thing that you brought up, Eric, is just, you know, you bought in your own backyard and that's really important because you can, it's really difficult to assess the value of a property when you're buying in another state mm-hmm. and you could well, be, we, we, it was in another state. Be, I mean, I'm in LA by the way, but, and we, so no, but we invest but, frequently in Memphis though. We know very, we're okay, very no, familiar talking, with the Memphis what, market. Okay, so you, and that's important to, to when you're starting out to invest yeah. in a market that you're familiar with. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're also yeah. going to find the best real, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You can also find real estate professionals that uh, you could develop an ongoing relationship with. So you don't have to re- reinvent the wheel the next time. You could go ahead and use this, you know, the same uh, buyer's real estate broker to represent you, you know, mm-hmm. the same real estate attorney, same property management, you know. And you, and you also, you really, you're going to find out that you're going to really want to buy where you have real, where you have really, a really good quality property management. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the key. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so that, that's very good. Uh, in terms of, uh, so we talk about kind of what it takes to get started. Is is this different? Like when you basically you identify the property now, this is very, and this is a daunting daunting task right now. The market is just incredible. We haven't been able to find. <laughs> uh the properties the right properties for us um but for the person that this is their first property did we did we touch was there any anything we need to talk about around qualifying making sure that you are actually going to be able to qualify for the mortgage for your property did we touch on these Yeah, yeah that's a really important thing uh so let's just say that you've been very fortunate and you have been able to save a really substantial down payment so that you could buy like a 10 or 12 unit property to get started in. The, what, okay, so um, what you really need to do is, uh, is probably contact a commercial mortgage broker to get started as far as financing goes because they're very familiar with, they have lots of different programs and, um, and they can actually point you in the right direction as to what you're going to qualify for. Otherwise, if you just call, um, like just to say you call your bank and you get uh, connected to a commercial loan officer. Well, what you need to do is know ahead of time, what are they going to be looking for to qualify you? In my book, I have a section on uh, two chapters on financing and one goes through the seven pre-approvals for a commercial loan where um, uh, where just buying a residential investment property, like a single family rental, you really only have two pre-qualifications. One is, uh, does, as a borrower, do you qualify? Do you have, the, you know, financially, do you have the uh, debt to income ratio to make this work? And then you also have the, the income, I'm sorry, you have the sales comparison approach and the appraisal. And so, um, so this really, you know, whether, you know, it's, it's really the, quality of the property, so to speak, and the quality yeah. of the borrower, that's two. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're going for, so, so it's really important to not waste your time or the lender's time. And you need, do need to know whether you're going to qualify for a loan. And what we're looking at as far as pre-qualifications is that since the great recession, actually it used to be, and we've talked about this, Eric, that the income of, pro, the, income of the property was king when you're mm-hmm. applying for a commercial loan. Uh, after that, the borrower became number one. Why? Because mm-hmm. it was because of the, because a, a borrower is not being strong enough that the Great Recession happened. Mostly, you know, in, in buying, uh, sing, you know, single family properties. But so uh, now it's just, it's, just, it's just a lot more stringent as far as the qualifications for the borrower. Like you need like a, you know, probably uh, a 680 credit score or above. Uh, and you need you need to be fairly strong financially, okay. But then we have to, we have to, we have the location of the property. You know, uh, community banks and credit unions have to lend prefer lending in their own backyard. Uh, they're also easier to qualify for because they don't have this really daunting uh, net worth to loan ratio or mm-hmm. require you to have a ton of cash when the when the property closes left over. Um, but then you but then we, we take a look at the income of the property. Um, you, you need to know uh, 
you know, you, you know, you go, you need to know whether this property is going to cash flow the loan that 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 you uh, want uh, mm -hmm. based upon the you know the the underwriting guidelines for that loan. Yeah. And so, you, so what you're going to be basically doing is calling. You could call. You could start with your bank and just find ask them some questions, interview them, find out what credit score do you need, uh, what experience do you need, you know, yeah. how much money do you need to put down, and so on. And then, so you're going to need uh, to know on these seven prequalifications. Uh, also, the condition of the property is one. Uh, that's really hard to know when you first meet a property. You know, it's just like uh, online dating. You know, you might not know that the person you're meeting, even though they might have the right appearance that you like, you might not know that they're stone broke and they're looking uh, for a sugar daddy or a sugar mama, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you really have to consider uh, when you, you know, you really need to know that, I mean, you're going to actually really come across as professional when you ask uh, a lender, you know, what 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 does it take for me to qualify in these seven yeah. pre-qualification areas? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the other thing to that, uh, I'll give, go ahead. No. Oh, so the other thing yeah. to that was uh, people need to be aware of is that the terms are, is one thing, right? So there's, uh, you know, this is, you, let's say you qualified for the loan and all of that, but as they go through, uh, so you have to go through your due diligence, knowing what the property looks like, and you have to be there on site. So if you're investing out of state, you need to go and fly them. If you're working full time, that means taking a couple of days off to fly to wherever to do the, be there for the due diligence so that you can see, see what's going on, unless you really trust the people that are on the ground. So that's one thing. But the bank is also doing their own kind of like due diligence. And um, every once in a while, they would put clauses in, in, their, uh, in their loans uh, requiring you to do some repairs. And they would keep money in escrow in order to, uh, for you to make sure that you are effectuating these, these repairs. So it could be I don't know if you have a boiler or if you have the roof or that uh, is damaged and stuff like that, they wouldn't want, in order yeah. to force you to do these repairs, yes. they were going to put, keep money in escrow. Yeah. So that's called replacement reserves. And mm -hmm. as a mortgage banking firm, we, we have uh, the, a lot of our loans, you know, you know, we do Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, CMBS, which is commercial mix, mortgage-backed security loans. And all of those four programs I just mentioned on larger loans do require, quite a, they quite often do require, require replacement reserves. But if you're just getting started, you know, actually going to a bank or credit union, it's going to be easier to get started there. Mm -hmm. uh, Freddie Mac does not require experience, but Fannie Mae does. Uh, yeah. CMBS loans uh, require experience. Uh, so, uh, but so you're not going to, but, but that does bring up something else is that you don't really, this is a business. And, you know, the, uh, one of my firms is called Business Loan Store. And mm -hmm. we've done hundreds of, of commercial I mean, business loans, uh, many of them with commercial real estate with them. And the number one reasons, reason that businesses fail is that they can't get through a rough time, let's say like COVID, like the pandemic we just are going through or have gone through because they don't have any working capital. So that's actually why, as Eric has mentioned, on these more sophisticated loan programs, they want you, they actually mandate that you put a chunk of cash aside for repairs and maintenance. Mm -hmm. And that's your money. And if, let's say if a hot water heater breaks down, you could, you, you know, you have to replace it and then you take, and then the lender will reimburse you out of that fund. But you don't have to worry about that with banks and credit unions and, um, and private money, mm -hmm. uh, which is certainly readily available right now. So, yeah, um, but you do want to have you do really want the, the largest, the greatest risk when investing uh, in any business and commercial real estate, multifamily property ownership is a business is not having your rainy day fund or working capital. Yeah. So yeah. just keep that in mind. You don't want to if you just have uh, all my clients that failed during the Great Recession, just the one, you know, it's because every time they got some extra capital, they bought another property with it. Yeah. The ones that made it through. Uh, are the ones that actually had cash, you know, always had a chunk of cash, you know, to make it through a difficult time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, yeah, and that's was that could be kind of like even though you have your twenty five percent down, sometimes you may have to come up with even more money at the table. 
to cover these replacement uh, escrow uh, escrow accounts. So that's that's something else to think about. Then you may have to find another investor to just uh, fund that um, or be creative with uh, with the seller or something like that. Um, so this is all very good information, Terry. Let's talk about the, the market. How do you see the market? We talked about how the market was, um, you know, very, very seller focused right now. And um, so let, let's compare, like I was thinking of comparing kind of like the, the multifamily, maybe the low, the low 60 units, uh, maybe low 40 units compared to, to the very large uh, multifamily, the, the 200 unit apartment building buildings. Uh, let's let's compare these two. Like any, do you see any any difference in these two types of uh, apartment buildings between the the kind of like the smallish one, medium size one, and the the massive one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here here's the thing: is that this is in just about all fifty states. Just as home prices have really soared in value, commercial properties have as well, and. The problem with that, I'm kind of like changing the subject just slightly, but I'll get into yeah. we'll get into the size of the property in just a moment. So, if the the problem with buying a commercial property today is that it's going to be overpriced, and especially multifamily properties. If if it's one of the properties that has really you know gone through a lot of failure recently, like office buildings, a lot of retail centers, and and hotel properties. Um, then you could probably you might be able to get something for a fair price with a good return, but otherwise we're looking at multifamily today. Almost all properties are overpriced. That means that the seller is actually going to be uh, taking most of your income for the first couple of years because they because the return on investment is not going to give you a very good cash on cash return for the, until mm -hmm. you could raise rents. So, but for sure, so it's, so we start taking a look at uh, like right now we have a client that has made an offer, a $47 million offer uh, on uh, like, uh, like a 200, 280 student housing project. Okay, that's mm -hmm. one end, that's like institutional grade. So on really large properties or even properties that are um, valued at over 20 million, let's say, we mostly have institutional buyers like REITs, yeah. uh, Real yeah. Estate Investment Trust, have all this money sitting there and they they're not making any money for their investors by letting it sit there so they'll buy a property at a very ex very expensive price today because the return that they do get is better than nothing but if you're just starting out for instance uh that's not going to be where you're coming from and and so what i'd like to do is compare is take a look at comparing somebody who's buying a 60 unit property today uh, which in some locations uh, is going to be uh, over $10 million. And in other locations, it's certainly going to be over $6 million. So, and then compare that to uh, somebody who's just getting started, who's buying, let's say, 12 units. And um, the difference is that the 12, the smaller property is actually going to be going at more per unit. We're not, mm -hmm. we generally don't see these large properties at going at two to 300, just say two to $300 per unit. Yeah. Uh, what you want to take a look at is replacement costs. And let's just say today in many locations, it's going to cost you, it's going to cost the, uh, it's going to cost maybe close to 200,000 to build uh, a one or two bedroom apartment in a lot of locations. And so, but, and that shows you that building actually developing, it's, it's a whole nother uh, ball game. And that's, I go into great detail in my, in my book on how to get started in that. But developing is really where it's at because you are going to make a profit because mm -hmm. it costs much less to build a property, a, a multifamily property than what they're selling for today. So, but there is a difference in price per unit. Uh, we don't see these really astronomical prices per unit on really large properties, you know, yeah. on okay. what we call mega properties yeah. that are, you know, priced at over 20 million. What we, what I noticed is that, or what I think I, I'm, how I'm seeing things is that the, the very large uh, apartment buildings, you get a lot of investors, uh, in institutional money like the REITs, Wall Street, the uh, pension funds, they invest in these things, and then right. they 
yeah, they, they have all this money. They have mi millions and millions of dollars are just sitting there and they are forced by their charter. They are forced to invest it into certain vehicles. So they're just going to put the money in there. They don't care how much it costs. They don't have, they don't live off of that, right? And then right. you have this. And, yeah, and, and I, Susie, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. It's because you're interrupting, but, but also with they, they're so experienced and they know mm -hmm. if they buy in a certain area that no matter what, uh, that the property value is going to go up substantially in five years. And so at that point, and so over time, uh, they're going to raise rents and, and maybe make some improvements, but they have, they have a tendency to buy primarily A and B quality properties, yeah. which are newer properties that don't need much work. And, uh, but they know that they're going to make most of their money from appreciation over time. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and, it's, and then when on the smaller side, then I have uh, like I have the these properties on the twenty units, uh, forty units getting a little bit difficult, but below twenty units, you can find still people that are the owner managed, they're self managed, and then they get tired, they're kind of like done done with that, and yeah, like you mentioned earlier, like they already know the tenants and all that kind of stuff. And you have a, you could potentially have a, a little bit of an edge there and be able to talk them into selling their properties. Yeah, you know, it's, um, and also, of course, if you can find, you know, if you could find a property, they're really hard to find today because there just aren't enough properties on the market. Mm -hmm. But if you could find a property with, you know, owner carry financing, sometimes these older, worn out sellers, you know, they have to sell for health reasons. Uh, Sometimes the, somebody's died and they, there's an opportunity there and the heirs want to sell the property, uh, mm -hmm. but they don't really have the energy or the know-how to run it. So, uh, but, but, uh, but anyway, but getting back to, but if the owner is just uh, worn out, you know, that's, that's an opportunity sometimes quite often to get seller carry financing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and those are great opportunities. You're going to be paying more for the property, probably, but um, you know, but but still, you could get your foot in the door that way. Yeah. All right. So, any uh, like, where is the hot spot right now in uh, in multifamily? And by hot spot, like a good area for me to invest. For, uh, it could be a, a specific uh, geography. It could be a special kind of, uh, of apartment building, special size or any special characteristic of the building well, where it's a good opportunity for me to buy. Okay, so in this market, this is kind of like this particular, the answer I'm gonna give you is kind of, kind of like contradictory. And it's kind of like a double-edged sword from the standpoint that it's quite, if you're, if you're new to uh, multifamily investment, uh, you really need to really look in your own backyard just for safety purposes. However, there's one caveat on that, and that's if you have really outstanding property management and you're able to go visit the property out of state quite often, then you, know, you can mitigate that risk. But, but, but otherwise, uh, surprisingly, there's, um, you know, there's still like uh, Greenville, North Carolina is a great, you know, property values are, are lower there. You could get quite a few units for the price. It used to be that Dallas Fort Worth was that way, but now property now values are there's just yeah. not enough properties in the value on the market, and, and those values are going up. You know, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, yeah, yeah. property values are still yeah. much lower. But yeah. you know, but that's just it. You know, if you live like let's say uh, in Los Angeles, you know, it's going to be very almost unaffordable, or San Diego, or Seattle, yeah. or, or yeah, where sure. I'm based in Portland, it's almost prohibitive to buy properties at the prices today. And so, but, so you have to be in a position to invest in property today for other reasons. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's that you, and this is going off on a tangent, but that's because you need the depreciation. Maybe you have a lot of income from your jobs um, and you, you know, you have, um, you know, income on your jobs, you have too much income, you need, you know, a tax shelter. Uh, and then you can wait it out until the property goes up in value along with rents in four or five years. Yeah. So, right. um, so I'd like to just interject and tell a story yep. about along those lines. Yes. And um, in, in 2018, I had a client that was a previous client and she was, she also, she was 
I can't say overly wealthy, but she was pretty strong financially. And her name is Tara, and she found this property uh, in Lincoln Park, Chicago, uh, near the zoo. I grew up in, near there, and I love that neighborhood. And she decided that she was going to buy this property at a five and a quarter cap. That just means in 2018, for a property that was built in the 1940s, was just too, the price was just too high, and probably the, you know the roofs needed repair and so on. There's a, the property needed work. She was buying this prop. She was wanted to buy this property pretty much at the same price that newer properties that didn't need hardly any work were going for. Yeah. Okay. So I just said, Tara, please don't do this. This is not a great idea. You know, and, and plus, she had not done enough homework on comparable rents. And her realtor said, well, if you make these improvements to the property, uh, so she would, you know, you could actually raise the rents 20%. But she was going to buy this property and put about um, 700000 into renovating it over a period of a year. And but what happened? So, so anyway, just to cut to the chase here, because she had other income and she could wait, she actually, um, her first year, she only made about a 2% cash on cash return, uh, which is really terrible. Her second year, a 4.5% cash on cash return, because now she's getting better rents. But, yeah. you know, and still, I still still not that great. Yeah. But, but I'm going to tell you that, that I just talked to her a couple of months ago, and now that now property values have literally gone through the roof in that neighborhood. And she's over do doubled her investment, her cash mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. So and it's and it's still going up. Yeah, so she yeah. hasn't made much. Really, she hasn't not made much on net income mm -hmm. from the property, but she she could get by. But now she's yeah. making out great. Her if, you're that, if you fit yeah. that, if you fit that, uh, you know those. You know, if you're that type of person in that situation, then you can actually you know buy prices. You can buy, you could buy today's prices and still come out a winner. Mm -hmm. But you need to know what you're doing. You know? Yeah. So there there you go. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you, uh, Terry. It was a pleasure. Um, let, before we wrap up, uh, anything you want to add uh, to our any, any nuggets of uh, knowledge or secrets that you want to share with our audience? Well, I would say uh, the number one advice that I always give people who are just getting started is to be cautious uh, if you really fall head, or, head over heels for a property where this has got, because you like it like it's looks. It's just like meeting somebody when you're dating for the first time. You've got yeah. to get to know them. So you've got, the most important thing is to really know what you're buying. If you're going to be paying too much for a property today, as we, we went gone over several times, then you need to know what your strategy is. And you can't, you, for instance, you really, it's really risky um, also. Second, besides just falling in love with the property because of its looks, um, you need to actually actually take the time to do your due diligence yeah. and uh, get the actual property financials. Don't go by just what the listing agent is telling you. And today, properties are being sold more based on uh, pro forma, based upon their potential than their actual. And when mm -hmm. I say to my clients, I said, well, let's say if this was a, a tire store, would you, and you were going to be selling tires now, buying a, an existing business, would you buy it based upon its potential income? Heck no, you're going to buy it based upon its, income, its net income today. Yeah, well, yeah. that's hard to do in this market. So, yeah, that's right. So be careful, just know that if you're going to be buying a, a property based on its potential, you need to know what your value add strategies are and what your chances are of achieving that mm -hmm. those value adds within a time frame that's not going to make you go broke yeah. while doing so. So yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And again, I'm going to put in the show note, obviously, a link to your book, The Encyclopedia of Commercial Real Estate Advice. Um, so again, don't get focused on the encyclopedia. This, this book is uh, full of stories and very practical advice from uh, Terry, his clients and his experience that he's sharing with us. So thank you, Terry. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Break Away from the Rat Race with your host, Eric Martel. If you want to share your story and experience with our listeners, please message us on Facebook at Break Away from the Rat Race. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast on iTunes.